Welcome, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and this is the Deeply Rooted Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Deeply Rooted. This is episode number 36. This kicks off our first one this year of 2020. Hard to believe we're that far into it, but we are. Seems like a, a sci-fi video, 2020, the number we'd always point out to it. But uh, glad to have Brother Aaron Edens here, pastor of Crossway Baptist Church. Got a really important episode coming up for you this year. A lot of people in transition in their life. Some people been going to new churches. Some people looking for a church home this year. And so I thought it'd be a great time to sit down with Aaron. He's written a brand new book called Church Pain, When Church Goes Too Far. So Aaron, thank you for being on the podcast today. Glad to be here. Uh, we want to go ahead and dive into it. What was the, the full purpose of the book you had in mind when you wrote it? Well, just to, uh, to highlight the experience itself of having pain in your heart as a result of a church split or a, a church that had exerted too much control and just to uh, highlight how that happens and why that happens and how to overcome that once it has happened. You got a lot of feedback since you've written the book? I have. Positive, negative? Positive, all positive. People were glad I wrote the book. I've received feedback from folks within our church here and folks uh, outside of our church, and uh, books have been sent several different states, you know, so a lot of good feedback. How long did it take you to write it? Uh, I guess I really don't have an exact answer, several months, but it's been in my mind for several years. Now, the book's broken down into three chapters or sections, and I wanted to kind of discuss each one of them in depth because they're very good and thorough. Uh, The first chapter talks about uh, what you refer to as signs as the church going too far. Uh, You've written down five of them. It's secrets, special leaders, standards, set apart, and sin. Um, if you would, do us a favor and kind of unpack each one of those and what it is that these signs ought to point out to us. Okay, and, and when I say church going too far, um, I'm obviously a pastor and I'm a church man. I believe in the local church and its necessity and the establishment of it by Christ. But when church goes too far, it exerts too much uh, dictatorial control in someone's life. And so here's five signs that you may be in a church like that. And I believe a lot of folks don't see this or see it and they don't necessarily know how to deal with it. But the first one is secrets. If you're in a church where there are secrets concerning the finances, uh, money is spent or sent here and there, or it's simply not accounted for, and no one really knows what's going on or why. And if there are secrets concerning people in the church, you know, uh, and I'm not saying we need to know everything about everybody. We don't. But, uh, you know, if things are being covered up or something like that, it's a problem. What would you give as advice for people that may be going to a church or maybe even starting a church? There might be guys out there listening to this that are looking for church plants or revitalizing churches. How do you put parameters in place and guardrails from that happening? Well, you have to be willing to be transparent and you have to be willing to admit that you are not God. You are simply God's man, emphasis on man. So you could make a mistake. I have made mistakes. Many good men have made mistakes. And so you have to approach it with humility and realize that you need to establish bylaws and rules ahead of time to keep yourself in check and other people in check. And you have to do that ahead of time. Don't wait until you're 10 years into it and realize, well, this thing's out of control. You need to really set parameters early. All right, your second sign was special leaders. Talk to us about that. Well, every church should appreciate their pastor. I don't like to hear people uh, denigrate their pastor. Uh, we're, as I just said, we're all human beings. We're men. I don't feel like I'm better than anyone in this church or any other church. But sometimes people elevate their pastor to a place of prominence that he is not supposed to be. 
uh, you know, and in the book I talk about leaders and how leaders are to be respected and so forth, and there's scripture reference for that. So I'm not going to go into all that now, but I'll just say this. Uh, a really charismatic leader who is beloved, if he is not careful, he can become too important to people. And his word and what he says and his feelings and thoughts can become too important to people. And so before you know it, well, this guy's the only guy we listen to. This is the only preacher in town. And uh, brother so-and-so said it, so it has to be right. So you got to be very careful about being a special leader. All right, your third one was standards. What did you mean by that? Um uh, Standards concerns, you know, unnecessarily legalistic rules. And again, I am a Bible preacher. You're a Bible preacher. We seek to preach what the Bible says. And if folks don't like that, I, I can't help that. I didn't write the book. But when we start making personal preferences and standards more important or as important as Scripture, we've went too far. That's happened in many places. I think the term a lot of people would use would be legalism. Yeah. You'll hear that taught a lot. I think some people can get off the rails, so to speak, in that, and we've all seen that before. Um, your fourth one you talked about was set apart. Yes. We're the only church in town. When you develop that attitude, you have isolated yourself, first of all, from many personal relationships that could be enriching and beneficial to you, and you've isolated corporately your entire church from a relationship that could be beneficial to them. Before you know it, you don't have outside preachers, you don't have outside singers, you don't have outside anything. It's just us four and no more. That's the mentality people get. So you got to be careful not to be set apart from everyone. And the fifth one, and probably the most, I guess, obvious, so to speak, when we look back on things, would be sin. And the point of that one is this, if usually in a, in a church where things go too far, usually there will be a subset of people that are uh, yes men or yes women to the pastor. And those folks then become important to him keeping his power. And then he becomes important to them keeping their power. So it's synergistic. They both feed on each other. So they overlook anything he does wrong, and he overlooks anything they do that is wrong. And so sin can be overlooked. Yet, in the congregation at large, look out. If you do something wrong, you're really going to be chastised. So those are the, the five signs, so to speak, looking at that we all ought to be aware of. Your second chapter in the book deals with the consequences of a church hurt. That is when it's went too far. Um, I do want to ask you this first question before we jump into that, though. Um, what do you think the line is between staying and leaving a church? Because in the consequences in that chapter you talk about and you're leading into the fact that people are going to have to make a choice and it's stay or go. What I guess the question to ask is, what would you not leave a church for? Some things that you have seen or aware of that people would leave that's probably not biblically based. Well, that's a tough question to answer because there's so many hypothetical situations I couldn't cover. But I'll go back to something I said originally, which is I have made mistakes as a pastor. Every pastor has. So you may be in a church where the pastor makes a mistake. And uh, just because he makes a mistake doesn't mean, hey, it's time to quit and we're going to leave. You know, maybe you talk to him about it. Maybe you take a brother with you and say, you know, this, you know, this is an issue. and Can we resolve this? Uh, and when you see the attitude of that person, you'll know then whether you should stay or leave. Because if the attitude is, well, you know, I'm, I probably have done something wrong here and I want to make this right. Or if they explain something and you realize, you know, I didn't really have all the facts about this. Because sometimes pastors can't say everything that people would like for them to say. So you may not have all the facts. But if you go to someone and the, the attitude basically is, 
don't question me. How dare you question me? No one questions me. Um, I'll just be frank. It's probably time to hit the door. Yeah. <laughs> now, on the flip side of that, I would argue I personally know a lot of people that have left without a what I would call a conversation or a confrontation. And it's hard for you to understand where that pastor stands without a conversation. That's true. So I think, you know, looking at it from that standpoint, we would urge people to, you need to have the conversation. Whether, yes. you know, you may be intimidated by that, but at the end of the day, you don't want to walk out over something that was false. Right. And I, you know, I failed to say this. You should pray about every matter like this because there is someone who does know every detail. There right. is someone who knows all sides to the story, and you should you should pray. And the Bible says in James 1, 5, if you lack wisdom, ask God. He'll give it to you liberally. He won't scold you for asking. So if you want to know, should I leave, ask God. And right. if he will either tell you to leave or not, that's what the Bible says. So I think that'd be the ultimate answer. And obviously, um, as you're praying, consider how to tactfully and respectfully do the other things that we've just talked about. Right. Now, in the book, you, you go on to talk about the ultimate reality that people who have left and that decision had to be gotten to. But uh, the question I would ask is walking us through those three consequences that you mentioned and kind of getting to that level. The first consequence you mentioned was doubt. Right. So the consequences here are dealing with someone who has stayed in an unhealthy situation for a long time. It is very difficult because usually a church that goes too far did not start out the way that it winds up, and it started out healthy and strong, and that's why you were there to begin with. And you develop, and I talk about all this, and you develop relationships and family connections, and your children grow up there, and they wonder what, you know, why are we leaving? So there's a lot of things to consider. So when that person then finally makes that emotional decision that, hey, I need to get out of here, because they've had so much trust in a quote unquote special leader because secrets have been kept from them that they didn't realize maybe until just, you know, right away. And, and standards have been so high that no one could attain them. Uh, they begin to wonder, is there really anything to any of this? And I'm not saying this because I have thought this or suspected it. I'm saying it because I've talked with people who've been through this and, um, it can lead to doubt. Is there anything to this? Because when you leave a church, that church is the closest thing you associate to Jesus. The pastor and the people are representatives of Jesus in your mind and heart, and you are to them. And so if that fails you, in a sense, subconsciously, this is my opinion, but I believe it's true, subconsciously, we feel like Jesus has failed. Yeah. Now that leads into your... Second consequence is discouragement. Yes. So you begin to doubt. And when you doubt your very worldview and the foundation you built your life on, it's very discouraging because where do I go from here? I mean, where, because there's no church that could be as good as that one was when I really went there and all that turned out to be a sham. So where do I go from here? Is it worth going anymore. Right. And starting over, difficult for a lot of people, uh, a lot of fear in that, starting over somewhere. Yes. And ultimately that can lead to this end game that you talked about in your third consequence, which was full on departure. Yes. I'm not going back to church. I'm done. Uh, I've been burned one time, but I won't be burned again. It's a very emotional decision. It's a very uh, life-changing decision. People that haven't been through this don't understand it. And I want to interject this. In, in, in writing this book and talking to people of all different denominational persuasions, when it comes to this subject, you're either very hot on it or very cold on it. If you're very cold on it, you read a book like mine, and I know this is true because I've had this reported to me. Folks have 
said, you know, I gave the book to my husband and they didn't know anything about this type of church or this type of experience and they just couldn't believe that someone would live through that. So there's, they don't really have any response to this. But people that have been through it, oh, they latch anything. They can see it, smell it, they can sense it, and they're really hot on the issue. And so it's a really emotionally driven, life-changing decision, and it's so life-changing that you'll ultimately say, I'm done. I'm not investing my whole being into anything like that again. Many people in this county, there may be somebody that listens to this, they are living where I just spoke. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. Now, the good news in the latter part of the book, the third and final chapter, you talk about the recovery. Yes. So there is hope, and that's what we want to talk about. So uh, explain why it's important to remember that hope still exists, even when there's painful church situations. Well... Hope exists because Jesus exists. He was here before your church. <laughs> you know, as I say that, I've, I've never said that before, but it's it's true. He was here before your church. He right. was here before this church. Right. There were people serving him in cottages, in shacks, um, in homes long before your church ever came along. He still lives, and there's one thing about him. He hasn't changed. Churches do. People do. You change. I change. Everybody changes, but he doesn't. So hope hope exists since he exists. Right. You use a great illustration out of uh, John chapter 20 that I want to talk about a little bit. It's regarding uh, the disciple Thomas. Um, tell us a little bit about that passage and why it's so important to understand recovery from church pain and how we can apply that to our circumstances? Well, the story is very personal to me um, for personal reasons. But Thomas really had the experience that many people have had in church in that it was really good for a while. I mean, someone might say, boy, our church has done a lot. Well, Thomas could say, well, I'll tell you what, I saw people raised from the dead. I saw him walk on the water. I saw him open blinded eyes. I saw everything. And I left all, and the Bible clearly states this, they left all right. and followed him. Just like people do in a church many times. They, they sell out to the Lord and, and they commit their finances and their, their life to a church. They sell out. And so Thomas did that for three and a half years. And uh, then all of a sudden... It ended. The best person he ever knew was crucified because of lies. And things happened that were out of his control. And sometimes that's what happens in churches. You see the best people you know essentially crucified because of falsehoods, wrongdoings, Ultimately, and I state this in the book, ultimately, why was Jesus crucified? Because a group of religious hypocrites had to have him out of the way. In church that goes too far, you will often, if not always, find religious hypocrites in power. And they wind up hurting the best of us. That's what happened to Thomas. He saw it happen to Jesus. Jesus is dead. There's been doubt now because the disciples came and told him, hey, we've seen the Lord. He said, I won't believe it. And, and I always, when I preach from this, I always make this statement. Thomas did not say, I cannot believe. He said, I will not. There's a big difference. Saying you cannot means I am not able to. Saying you will not means I have made a conscious decision that I will not put myself through this right. again. I will not believe. He told the disciples that doubt. No doubt there was discouragement, and Thomas was ready for departure. 
Now, the good news, you talked about the best man he knew in that situation is crucified. He's also the one he has to come back to, and you make a great point in the book. He's also the one we look to yes. for the example of the recovery. Talk a little bit about uh, maybe any words of wisdom you might have to share with the listeners about making sure that Jesus is the center of attention in all the recovery. Well, the first thing you have to remember is in the story of Thomas, he kept hanging around. There was still a flicker in his heart. And the next time Jesus showed up, Jesus said, Thomas, put forth your hand. And you can see that I'm alive. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. So when we're doubting, when we're discouraged, and when we're departing, he loves us just like he did when we were on the front lines. We don't preach this enough. I don't give an excuse to people. There's no excuse for me or anyone else for not doing what we should do and for not doing what's right. But the fact is Jesus loves us on our best day, which isn't as good as we think it is, and on our worst day, which isn't as bad as we think it is or as bad as the devil would like us to think it is. So he loves us. And if we'll keep that in mind, if he loves me now just like he did before, I ought to serve him now just like I did before. may not be the same place, may not be the same way, but there's still a life worth living. There's still a Savior that's worth serving. And I would echo that. I'd encourage you to do that if you're out there right now and you've listened to this and you want to pick a copy of this up. We'll get to that in just a moment in the final thoughts, but it's imperative that you get back in the body of Christ. It's imperative that you get back into a local church. It's vital. It's healthy. It's right. It's biblical. Um, You need people. People need you. You're a part of the body. Uh, We struggle without the full members, and I think it's important to know that. So if you went through that church pain, if you get nothing else out of this, make sure you remember you need to be into a local church it's the right thing to do. It's the godly thing to do. It's the God-honoring thing to do Yes, to be a part of that. So thank you for tuning in. We'll be right back with some closing announcements and give you some information about how you can get the book in just a second. Thank you. All right, closing out episode 36 here with Pastor Aaron Edens of Crossway Baptist Church. We've talked a lot about his book here, Church Pain, When the Church Goes Too Far, and we brought him back here with some final closing remarks. What would you like people to know about the book, just briefly? Well, uh, this book is my heart, and I believe that uh, it could be a help to a lot of folks. So if you know someone that's not been in church or someone that's been scarred by a bad, painful church experience, uh, I would hope you would get a copy of the book and give it to them because I think I think the story of Thomas and the way the Lord has shown me to look at it, I think it could be helpful to folks. Now, people listening right now are probably obviously asking, how can they get a copy of it? So once you walk them through uh, that process, if they'd like a copy of the book. Well, uh, graciously, the church at Crossway bought every book, and that way we can distribute them freely. So if a person wants a book, they can simply message our church Facebook page, Crossway Baptist Church, or you could email me at anedens at gmail.com, and I can see to it that you get a book. We will take care of shipping it to you wherever you are, and, and that's as many books as you would want as well. All right, we'll make sure to leave a copy of that email address there at the bottom of all of our platforms. And as always, make sure you check us out on our Facebook page, Follow us there for all the updates and information we have, and make sure you also subscribe on iTunes and on our YouTube channel as well. We'd love to hear from you, so reach out to us through our Facebook Messenger, or you can reach us through email. That's drigw18 at gmail.com. So we hope you've got something out of this. Until next time, God bless you all, and hope you have a great week in Jesus.